You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagun Yedile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I am joining you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation, also known as the Vancouver UBC campus. And here with me, of course, is uh, Shagan. Hi, Shagan. How are you? Hi, Claudia. I'm great. Thank you. And I am joining you today from Kelowna, which is in the traditional, unceded, and ancestral territories of the Silks Okanagan Nations. And we have a wonderful guest today and i will just allow her to introduce herself hi nika hi thank you so much for having me uh, my name is nika ford and i'm a certified medical illustrator um, i'm from atlanta georgia and i went to university of illinois at chicago where i studied medical illustration and um, currently I own my own business. Uh, I started it this year, it's called Inlight Visuals, which is a scientific and medical visualization studio. And um, yeah, I'm excited to speak with you all today. We're so happy to have you here. Thanks for joining us. And um, tell us about your journey. How did you decide to become a medical illustrator? Well, I've always been an artist since I was a kid. I've always been drawing and painting. And um, I went to a magnet arts high school where I focused a lot on just art in general. And um, after that, I went to Georgia Southern University to study fine arts. And at this point in time, I had no idea that medical illustration was a career, um, but I had a focus on studio, studio art. And I also had an interest on science that I wasn't really pursuing because I was an art major and art degree. Um, I just hadn't taken a lot of science courses, so I didn't know much about it, but I always had this interest in anatomy and science and just how things work in the world, especially life science. Um, so what I started to do was um, in my spare time, I would like check out library books on histology and botany and anatomy, and that inst inspired my artwork. So the art that I started to create during my like junior and senior year for my thesis shows was inspired by science. Um, and what I would do was find connections that I saw between anatomy and nature. And I would depict that in kind of like surrealistic sort of paintings. And one of my drawing teachers saw my artwork and um, told me about the field. And I had no idea I researched it. And I knew right away that that was exactly what I wanted to pursue as a career. Cause then it was a way to combine this like interest that I had in science and my passion, which had always been art. And um, so I, I mentioned before, I went to University of Illinois at Chicago to get a graduate degree in medical illustration. Um, when I graduated with my undergrad degree in fine art, I didn't really have any like science course um, education or knowledge. So I was, I applied to be a post back student, which is a part-time um, like post-grad student. And I took science courses um, in Atlanta, Georgia at a university called Clayton State. And uh, once I got those science requirements fulfilled, I was able to get into the master's program for medical illustration. So currently there are five um, grad uh, schools that offer grad degree uh, that are accredited in, in North America in, uh, in medical illustration. So um, yeah, after I graduated from there in 2017, um, shortly after that, I was hired at a medical school in New York City. So uh, that was at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And I worked there for almost five years um, as an academic medical illustrator. And uh, recently I just started my own company this year. And so now I'm doing it for myself full time. That's... Such a great uh, thing to hear, Nika. And uh, uh, it's very, I think a lot of our students will draw inspiration from what you've just, uh, your journey that you've just described. And uh, just because it shows them what's possible. And and um, I'm preempting Claudia here, but, but, I, <laughs> but I'm, I wanted to follow up on her question in terms of 
So how did how what's your experience in that field um, so far? Because one thing that we have uh, found from from our anatomy books, uh, atlases, and so on, is that the body is depicted in a particular way, in a particular color, you know, very, you know, in a, just in a kind of stereotypical, um, mon monolithic way. And Jagan, are you talking about white CrossFit man again? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> So you have followed a different uh, a different path, and and I just wanted to ask about that journey and what's what's stimulated that direction that you took. Yes, Nika, because when I look at your portfolio, there's no white CrossFit man. What happened? <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> um, so I definitely noticed that pretty early on through the anatomy books that I was using to study from, like. Gray's Anatomy, um, all of the standard ones that they use in um, in medical schools and stuff. I noticed that, and um, yeah, it, it feels very isolating, um, like not to have images reflected that look like you in those kind of books. And so, just like naturally, um, even with my art, I was already painting people that resembled me in a way. So naturally, I just started to um, create medical illustrations of people with different like skin tones and different body types, um, and it was something that stood out to me a lot in my training, um, just like the lack of diversity, even on Google images, when you search for something on Google, if you want to look up a medical, you know, like pathology or whatever it is, it comes up with, um, like you were saying, a monolithic kind of um, image that you see of like this white male body that's always thin and athletic. Um, and that's uh, very harmful to have that looked at as a quote unquote standard because it's not, it marginalizes everyone that does not look like that and um, can be very isolating and disassociating for people that um, do not have that similar physique. Um, and so just looking at human variation in our world and, and how important it is for images that we see to be reflective of all different kinds of people, that's something that I really try to hone in on focus focus in on now with my medical il illustration work. Um, medical illustration is, you know, it's not just like pretty images of anatomy. They're actually educational tools. They affect the healthcare system and the way that physicians are trained. So I do think that in a way, medical illustration has a really like a large impact on patient health um, uh, via different ways. But uh, one of the main ways working in medical school, like I did, that I saw was that um, physician bias can come from physicians not being exposed to a diversity of um, education, uh, education resources and visuals and in their training. Um, and so then when they treat patients, um, there can be that sort of implicit bias coming through stereotypes and all those sorts of, sorts of things. So I think Working in a medical school um, also made me realize it in, um, in more distinct ways, um, how it's very important for that sort of training and the way that patients are treated um, eventually. Thank you so much for that, Mika. And it's, I mean, so true, of course, right? And thank you for the work that you've done in that field. You said that you'd always been drawing bodies in your art, even before becoming a medical illustrator or starting on that journey. Um, my question, I guess, is um, more personal. How has your journey changed your perspective on human bodies? Kind of, um, what was it like to learn anatomy? What was it like to um, learn more about um, what makes up the human form? And uh, then translating that back into illustrations. Um, has, your, has your perspective on the body changed? Yeah, I think it has. I think overall, I have more of an appreciation for the human body. Um, I think just in general, but also specific, specifically for myself and my own health. Um, I think that when I understand certain like physiology, physiological processes or, um, you know, anatomy and, and think about it in terms of my own body, it makes me a lot more conscious of my own health and, and just like how I treat myself. Um, and so that can affect, you know, like my, I feel like my workout regimen increased after graduate school. Um, I eliminated certain things out of my diet that were harmful. I definitely think it had a sub conscious effect, even if I didn't realize it, about my own health, um, learning about anatomy and learning about how the body works. Thank you for that. Shagan, you have a, a question about um, more 
how the art resonates. So Nika was just wondering about what the reception for your work has been so far. Um, you, you've worked in the medical school, now you're out on your own. Have people uh, told you about the impact your work has had on them? What has that been like? Yeah, it has. Um, it's been really great um, and very gratifying. Um, I actually recently just gave a talk at Frank Netter's School of Medicine uh, last week. <laughs> so I'm just getting back from that. And I um, I spoke at their 10th anniversary symposium. And I spoke specifically about the kind of work that I do. And I also had a portion of my presentation where I discussed how medical illustration is a catalyst for health equity. And uh, the response that I got afterwards was, was very gratifying, um, having professors come up to me and just speak about how they had been teaching for years and did not really see much diversity and in inclusivity in their visuals that they were using to train students and um, how much it was needed and how much they were grateful to see that the kind of work is being created now. Um, so I think that kind of response um, really like helps motivate me as well. And it, it also, it feels good to know that medical illustration is having that sort of impact. Um, and I think that that also is what, what adds to my passion with what I do with my work is the sort of impact that it has. Um, also working within the medical school itself, um, just creating illustrations for journal publications, um, for research grants and things like that. Um, all of those sort of visuals helped the paper. Um, I've even done an illustration once where the client I was working with uh, was a um, surgeon and told me that he actually rewrote a portion of the paper that was describing um, the particular procedure that I was illustrating. He actually re rewrote it after seeing my illustration because it just gave him more clarity and it helped him describe it in more of a clear way. So in that way, medical illustration has the potential to um, impact and po will positively impact medical literature. Um, so that was a really great experience for me too. And, and it made me realize why sometimes medical illustrators are listed as second authors on papers um, because of that reason. That must have been a huge moment to, um, to have had that type of impact with the like original author of something that you're illustration things just made it so much more clear congratulations that's, Thank you. that's really wonderful um i find we're all having a moment of uh reckoning with uh, sort of the institutionalized racism that has pervaded our society and our field in particular for decades generations centuries forever maybe um and i feel after our uh Double pand double demic summer of COVID and uh, after the murder of George Floyd, things have changed and that they've changed specifically in our field. I remember we had a reckoning in our own team about representation, and I feel the um, so many medical illustrators are coming together to address this issue, um, and. Um, things are changing, like the American Association for Anatomy is sponsoring the pop art program, um, you know, where we're looking at different representation of people. Um, you're the chair of the diversity committee in the American or in the Association of Medical Illustrators. Um, tell us what these years have been like for you as we're just in this moment collectively and you were right there at the forefront. Yeah, um, so I have been the chair for about two and a half years, and um, it's been really great um, working within leadership in the association. So I've been a member of um, AMI, um, Association of Medical Illustrators, for, um, I want to say like seven years now. It's been a while. Um, like since I was a grad student, I've been a member. Um, and I got involved in the diversity committee when it was first started um, around 2016. And um, I immediately joined and was on a member for a couple of years and then became chair. And so um, one of the things that we really try to focus on is community respectful engagement within the association. Um, but we also have a lot of initiatives that we um, conduct in order to bring more inclusivity and diversity in the organization itself, but also 
promoting it within our work too. So kind of both of those facets. Um, another thing is just how important leadership is, diverse leadership in an organization. So that's another thing that we work on too. Um, and I think it's been a really great experience. Um, it's now the largest committee within the AMI. It's grown really large and um, people are very interested. Like you were saying, um, a lot of folks are now realizing just the impact that historically medical racism has had and how that needs to be reversed and changed. Um, and so within the organization, a lot of medical illustrators are now depicting more diversity in their work um, and are very passionate about it as well. And um, with our committee, we do a lot of outreach. Uh, we try to engage uh, high schoolers and college students, um, just bringing awareness about the field. That's really, if you want to increase diversity within an organization, I think the number one thing is to increase awareness. Um, and so that people of different backgrounds at least know about it as a career option. Uh, There's so many fields, career fields that young folks don't even know exist. And medical illustration is one of those very niche ones that you don't hear about. Um, and so bringing awareness is something we really focus on. And um, we have a lot of other initiatives. Um, we've created affinity groups, which are kind of um, like support groups um, that different people of, of different backgrounds could join and be part of a smaller community within the organization itself and outside of that, which was expanded outside of the AMI. And um, we've, um, in, we've implemented a salon award. So the salon is an art exhibit that the Association of Medical Illustrators has every year at their conference. So we've put in place a social impact award now that kind of encourages people that submit to the salon to um, submit pieces that are um, addressing diversity, health equity, or inclusion. And we give an award for that. Um, we also, I have also organized um, training, um, anti-racism training, and educational webinars for the AMI. Um, so a lot of different things that we've been working on and doing over the past uh, couple of years, I think have really been helping foster that sense of community inclusivity within the organization. That sounds excellent, Nika, and, and congratulations for all the, all the success you've had so far. And um, on the other hand, one thing that uh, when people who are involved in EDI work, when we sit across tables, we like to share about some of the challenges that we also face. Uh, and, and I'm wondering that in the middle of all of the success that you've had, um, what are some of the common challenges that you, you face in this line of work uh, in, in terms of it, trying to broaden the diversity among the community of, of illustrators, broaden the uh, just the outlook and approach that people have towards bodies in general um, and how do you think we can overcome those kind of challenges? Yeah, I think a lot of times what happens is um, people kind of get used to things being a certain way. And so then when you come in and kind of shake things up and um, implement new ideas, um, there can just be pushback just because people get really complacent or comfortable with the way things have always been. So that's something that I've noticed um, that kind of happens with DEI work. Um, and I think that when it makes people uncomfortable, then it is a good thing. <laughs> um, so the discourse, you know, having that discourse, it can feel uncomfortable, but at least I know that if that happens, then we're doing something right. Um, and, and that definitely has happened within the, this kind of work that I've been doing. And um, I think like another thing is the emotional labor, just as like a person of color, when you're leading DEI efforts, um, there is an emotional labor facet to it that others may not understand. And I can sometimes it 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 feels like imposter syndrome or it feels like maybe what I'm doing um, isn't enough. Um, like all those sort of things compounded on top of the actual work itself. Um, so that's something that I think that individuals that do DEI work do deal with. But I also feel like having support, having someone you can talk to um, really helps a lot. And I think for me being um, as part of the committee, I have a co-chair and a vice chair. And so having that shared leadership helped me a lot getting through those sort of moments of um, the emotional labor part of it. And um, we really work together as a team. Um, so that makes it feel a lot more like we're actually like moving somewhere and it, you know, I'm not doing it alone and of us are doing it by ourselves. Um, so the community aspect really drives it um, and, and is also the reason for it too at the same time. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you, Nika. And thanks for mentioning sort of the personal impact that that has. I think 
the emotional labor is something we need to call out, right? It's not trivial. The, the toll it takes on the individual because you're dealing not just with the work, but also with the personal impact. And often those in minoritized roles are the ones who have to take on that labor of educating everyone else on top of everything. That's not fair. Um, and so thank you for, for doing that work and thanks for calling it out um, and normalizing calling that out because I think that's important that we are frank about that um, and can have, you know, can make change. And you point out the importance of community there, which I think is uh, so critical in all of this. And I do think, just looking at it from the outside, that that community moment is making real change. It's uh, it's everywhere and it's making illustrations better. Um, and if I look at what you are saying about the surgeon looking at the illustration and rethinking their paper, um, I can see this happening sort of within the entire field. We have a more diverse array of illustrations and it makes people rethink about what bodies look like and what is normal and how pathologies present and and all of that. Do you want to comment on that a little bit more? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, that's a great point. And uh, I, I think that it's also humanizing people more. Um, just the, the the difference in human variation that's being shown in the work now, um, it just like humanizes it collectively and shows that like everyone is not the same. We all look different and um, everyone is unique in their own way and deserves equal and equitable uh, care in the healthcare system. Um, I've noticed like just a lot of health disparities that I feel like have been around for just a long time and they are perpetuating on top of themselves. And so um, I definitely feel like it's a, a role of, um, you know, medical illustrators and not just medical illustrators, but just anyone who works in the healthcare medical field um, to to reverse that. And so that means practicing it in an, in an anti-racist way, which means you have to take specific actionable steps to kind of like restore that piece. Um, and it's sort of like, I forget who says the quote, but um, knowing about it isn't enough. You have to take action in order to change something. Um, so I think being intentional about it is really important. Um, and yeah, I think that just like collectively um, just showing human variation is just like so beautiful. Um, and also, not just you know with race, but there's also been anti-fat bias, um, a lack of representation of different uh, disabilities, um, also gender as well. Um, so there's a lot of different areas where there's been a lack of representation, and I do see that changing in, on, in all those areas now. Yes, uh, I, I couldn't agree more, Nika. And uh, yeah, more part to you as you go on uh, on this journey, and I just hope that listeners and especially our students who are working in this line will take uh, some motivation and, and, and inspiration from, from your work. Um, my question is about, as you have worked um, in, in this field as, an, as a medical illustrator, uh, working uh, uh, in diversity uh, issues, has anything surprised you, either in terms of your own work or the experiences that you have, you, you've had you know, um, because I, I find that sometimes it's that unexpected response or that unexpected comment or that unexpected encounter that I have that that helps me also to think and to reflect and take my work forward. So I'm just curious to say, you know, uh, in this many years, uh, especially as you've, been, as you've kind of uh, emphasized the issues of diversity, have you come across things that have been so maybe pleasantly surprising to you? Yeah, I'm actually glad you asked that question um, because I have. I would say working at the medical school, um, I had a number of clients who I would work with who would actually specifically request the kind of patient they wanted depicted in the illustration. And they would specifically say, I want someone who's not white, who's like, you know, a female or a black woman. Um, and so that was really nice to hear. And that did surprise me because I usually just sort of take it in my own hands to just do that when I get a project, even if they don't specify 
I'll just try to make sure I'm thinking about diversity. But I've had um, I've had a number of clients specifically say that. Like, so it was nice to know that they were thinking about that already and that they realized that that was something that they wanted to change or, you know, highlight in their research or whatever, you know, paper that they were writing um, that was important for them. So that surprise, that was a very pleasant surprise. Excellent. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, and it shows, I think, I think it's testament to your work and, and the work of others that increasingly more and more people are thinking along these areas and feeling that they also want to be part of change, uh, want to be part of the change for the better, to ex just to illustrate and show that there are many different types of bodies, not the uh, typical white male CrossFit <laughs> person. Um, so, well, this is the part of our podcast where we ask you whether you've ever encountered or thought about this. Do you have a favorite body part? <laughs> Do you have any part of the anatomy of 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 humans that um that kind of intrigues you or is your favorite and why um yeah i think i do i would say probably the cerebellum um I, oh my gosh I, Mika, really yeah i love that <laughs> Um, I get a lot of like neuroscience and neurosurgery projects. Um, and so I've drawn like a ton of brains. So I think I just naturally really like drawing the brain now. And um, I don't know, I, I really like drawing like gyri and sulci. Like it's really fun to draw. So I would definitely say that's my favorite part. <laughs> I think you suddenly became one of Claudia's most favorite people in the world. <laughs> I mean, Nick, I liked you at the beginning, but oh my oh, gosh, this is so <laughs> favorite body part twins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I put it for the whole brain, but within the brain, I love oh. the cerebellum. It gets such, um, it gets so neglected, right? In the posterior cranial fossa, little brain, we don't talk about it. I think motor yeah. something, and it turns out it does everything. Mm -hmm. It's so cool. Anyway, thank you for, mm -hmm. it's our first cerebellum for favorite body parts. So thank you for that. Really oh, awesome. that. So what's your least favorite body part? Um, I've never thought about that before, but the first thing that's coming to my mind is the appendix, but only because I don't know what its purpose serves. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's an evolutionary. Yes, now you've scored, now you've scored a point with me because <laughs> that was my least favorite body part. Oh wow! You're so perfect for this podcast. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yes, yeah, great. Yeah, the appendix. I, I, I think it does have an. Well, we know it has some evolutionary purpose, but nowadays it just kind of hangs out and does, you know, gets infected. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So, that's so cool. That's so cool. Have you ever illustrated an appendix? I haven't, no. I guess that would be an interesting you, project. Yeah, do you think your relationship with the appendix would change after you illustrate it? It probably would, because that's definitely why I love the brain more. So I think it would. <laughs> okay, so maybe the appendix is redeemable. It just needs to be illustrated properly. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Okay. Well, Nika, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been uh, such an interesting and important conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your work and your thoughts. Um, and I hope that you will continue to inspire this generation of medical illustrators and that this change that we're seeing is going to gain momentum and change the world. Thank you for being part of that. Thank you, Nika. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time.